Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our Sum TV Sabbath School program and worship service. We're so pleased that you decided to join us today for this spiritual feast. Our preacher today is someone very beloved by all who work here at Secrets Unsealed, C.A. Murray, a good friend, a powerful preacher who bases what he says on God's holy word. We trust that you will enjoy the worship service today, that it will edify you and inspire you as well as us to be more faithful to Jesus. God bless, and once again, happy Sabbath. Is Jesus knocking on your heart today, softly and tenderly, calling for you? Let's sing number 287, softly and tenderly.
Welcome friends, happy Sabbath, and welcome to Secrets Unsealed and Some TV Sabbath School Hour, The Church at Study. We are hoping that in our discussion today and in, and in our review of the lesson, that we will say something, we will mention something, a point will be made that will draw you closer to your Creator and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. That you will give your heart to the Lord and that you will draw too close to Him in a loving, saving relationship. Before we get started with our lesson today, I'd like to introduce my panel. And uh, to my right, we have uh, Pastor Miranda, Daniel Miranda, who is the Associate Pastor at the Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, my pastor. And uh, Pastor, it's nice to have you with us this morning. Thank you, Melvin. You are my first elder. <laughs> so it's good to be with you here, All teaming right, together. That's right. And with Pastor Bohr as well. Pastor Bohr is to my left, our president and speaker for Secrets Unsealed, better known to us here as Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> we love him, and it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Jesus taught us to beware of the rabbis. <laughs> but uh, it's always good to be here for the Sabbath school class. It's my second most favorite thing at Secrets Unsealed. My most favorite is I'd like to know. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we'll see what we can do to bump that up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this quarter we have been studying the topic, Three Cosmic Messages, better known to most of us as the Three Angels Messages, the last warning messages to planet Earth, found in the book of Revelation chapter 14. And uh, this week we are going to be studying the topic, the Sabbath and the end, the Sabbath and the end. But before we get to that, we're going to ask Pastor Miranda if he'll pray for us and Pastor Bohr if he'll read our scripture for the day. All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're trying heaven as we begin the study of this lesson. We pray, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit may direct and guide this study. And especially as we touch on this very important topic of the Sabbath and the end times. Pray, dear Lord, that you may help us see the significance of the points brought up here and how we can apply them to our lives. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Our scripture memory text uh, for this week is found in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It reads like this, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Mm. All right, very good. As I said before, this week our lesson is entitled, The Sabbath and the End. And I want to start in Revelation 14, uh, verse 7, where we have the first angel speaking, and he says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him, that's important, worship Him, and then the next, Im the next important phrase is, who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that, that's an important concept there. Right. That the one we're to worship was the one who created. That's important. And we'll touch on that as we go along. But we will come to know in our lesson study today that um, in the creation, God made a perfect creation. And uh, he placed a value on every person yes. that he created, an infinite value, because we know that he sent his son to redeem his fallen creation. Uh, and so it matters not the last name that you bear, the color of your hair, your eyes, your skin, your height, your weight, you are of invaluable value yes. to God. Amen. And what he longs for most 
is for his creation to draw close to him in a loving, intimate relationship. Now, having said that, we need to look at the idea of judgment, creation, and accountability, mm -hmm. which we find in Sunday's lesson. Judgment, creation, and accountability. So let's read some text and see where we go with that. Uh, Pastor Miranda, if you will read Romans 14.10. Pastor Bohr, if you will read James 2, 8 through 13. I'll pick up on Revelation 14, 7, <coughs> that part that uh, is specific to this discussion. So, when okay, pa Romans, Pastor Miranda, when you get there. Yes, okay. Romans 14, 10, and I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, And why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, make a little commentary on that, just to bring us into our discussion. Very good. So here we are told that we all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, which means that judgment is something universal. We will all be judged. It doesn't matter if you believe or you do not believe. Judgment is a universal matter. And that's why in the context here of loving our neighbors, it says that um, we need to not judge our neighbors because we will be judged mm -hmm. in heaven. So. In the judgment in heaven, according to this text, even the way I treat others will be considered. Okay, so this idea kind of implies that we are accountable. We are accountable, exactly. We're, we are yes. accountable. Pastor Boer, if you'll read your text. Uh, yes, uh, James chapter 2 mm -hmm. and verses 8 to 13, New King James Version. <clears throat> if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Comment on that as, as it relates to judgment, creation, and accountability. Uh, once again, the idea in this passage is showing no partiality. It has to do with valuing everyone equally. And the reason we can value other people is because they're God's creatures. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't believe that God was the creator, if we believe that everything came into existence by evolution, then what basis is there for valuing other people? Mm -hmm. In fact, what uh, purpose is there in valuing even ourselves if we come originally from apes and then go back to maybe a, a, an amoeba or a blob or something, you know, it takes away uh, human dignity. Okay. And so the basis of these two texts, Romans 14, uh, verse 10, and this passage is uh, that we will be judged not only by the Ten Commandments, we will be judged by the way in which we treat people because the, uh, the fulfillment of the law is uh, loving like God loves. Yes, yes. Uh, on, yes, love God, love your neighbor. On these two hang all the law. Amen. Yeah, and so, yeah, it, 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 the, the, there's a focus here uh, that the same law that specifies not to commit adultery is, and, and not to steal from our neighbor and not to covet from our neighbor, not to, not, not to bear false witness against our neighbor is the same one that says, we should love our neighbor as ourself. And in doing so, we are acting as if God would act, as God acts, not yes. actually, as God acts towards and, us. And this, this all is put together when we realize that we're a common creation. Hmm. Actually, if we would give another definition to sin, is sin is whatever destroys the image of God. Hmm. Because when I sin against another person, I am not only erasing or defacing the image of God in myself as the sinner, but I'm also 
doing the same thing to the other person. And therefore, um, the law, which is the, uh, as, as Pastor Bohr read in James chapter 2, we will be, just, will be judged by the law of liberty, is because the law determines or actually delineates how we should treat, uh, at least the second commandment, how we should treat one another uh, to keep and preserve the image of God, which takes us back to creation because He is our Creator. Well, ultimately, the Ten Commandments are about relationships. Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, if there was no one else other than me, the Ten Commandments would be ridiculous. They wouldn't have any function. Right. The first four commandments did describe my relationship with God, and the last six, my relationship with my fellow human beings. So, if I love God and my fellow human beings, I will keep the Ten Commandments. Yes. Not as an obligation, but because I realize that others are made in the image of God just as I am. Yes, and it said that the, that the law is the transcript of the character of God. And so, if we were created in His image, then being in alliance and in alignment with Him, we uh, will have that same character reproduced in us. And so then, the keeping of the law is merely the acting out of the impulse of God within us mm -hmm. and not something external that we relate to as a, as, as a must-do. Mm -hmm. uh, it is what comes from us through impulses of the Holy Spirit. Correct. You know, uh, if I just might interject this here, being that we're talking about accountability, um, the main reason why people feel comfortable with uh, an evolutionary theory of beginnings mm is because it eliminates accountability. Yes, yes. You see, if we believe that God was the Creator, we are accountable yeah, yeah, yeah. for our actions to our Creator. Correct. But if we believe that we come as a result of the force of natural forces, so-called, you know, natural selection, mm -hmm. the survival of the fittest, you know, where is the basis for human dignity? What are, where is the basis that we have to render an account to someone someday? So evolutionary theory, it eliminates the idea that I have to be accountable to a creator eventually. Yeah. That's yeah. why people feel so comfortable with it, because <laughs> they feel like they can sin and they're not accountable to anyone. Yes, yes. And also, if we come from or we're the result of an evolutionary process, then that means that there are other forces outside of myself that um, determine what I do mm. and how I act and how I, how I live. Yes, yes. And therefore, whatever I do is not my responsibility yes. because I'm just the byproduct of the environment. Yeah, so then I have no moral accountability or right. responsibility. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all some force of nature made me do it. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> and the bottom line is that uh, the evolutionary theory is based on the survival of the fittest. Mm. So, you know, the strong win and the weak lose. Yeah. And so, you know, if you have a weaker brother who, who maybe has uh, some physical de uh, deficiency, by the way, this is what drove the Holocaust during, mm. the, during yes. the, uh, Hitler Germany, uh, is, is the fact that they tried to get rid of everybody who was not mm -hmm. perfect, yes. physically perfect, and the reason why is because they, they use the theory of uh, the survival of the fittest. Yeah. You know, so why should I help my weaker brother <laughs> if I go by the theory of evolution? Yeah. You know, uh, I need to be stronger than him or mm -hmm. than her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a book written uh, uh, right around that time called Man's Search in, in, uh, for Meaning or In Search of Meaning. I can't remember. Uh, Victor Frankl. And he speaks about the survivors in the concentration camps mm -hmm. finding meaning in assisting th their fellow men to survive another Amen. day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though they may have uh, been weaker physically, you know, the importance mm. was that I do all I can to assist my brother uh, to live and to survive Amen. another day, uh, mm -hmm. which, which flies in the face of, of, of this... Uh, evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Now, we want to take, take a, a, a turn to the idea of Sabbath and creation, because in this text that you read about uh, not committing adultery and, you know, one who offends and one point offends and all, the Sabbath is included in that then. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
here's an issue that uh, I just received uh, from, you know, in an email uh, from one of my evangelical associates who says, there is no command for man to keep the Sabbath at creation. <laughs> and so he says, well, then we don't need to keep the Sabbath. And the first time it appears at Sinai, uh, and so it was for the Jews. So, but we're going to be talking about the Sabbath in this lesson. And so how, how do you respond to that? Well, I think uh, Pastor Bohr has, um, has a study, <laughs> so... <laughs> Calling, passing the money. <laughs> yeah, the bottom line is that uh, we need to understand that the first week is God's week. It's not man's week, mm -hmm. because God worked six and God ceased. Shabbat is translated better ceased. Yes. He ceased on the seventh. The fourth commandment applies to human beings during the second week, not the first week. Because mm -hmm. the first week God worked six, ceased on the seventh, and then He tells Adam and Eve, now you follow my example. You work six and you cease the next seventh day from your work. And so why is there no command in Genesis chapter 2 for Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath? Mm -hmm. It's very simple. They hadn't worked. <laughs> the commandment says, work six and rest the seventh. If God had said, you know, Shabbat, cease, Adam and Eve would say, cease from what? Right. We haven't worked. And there are other reasons too. Uh, you know, for example, um, God needed to create the Sabbath before He could give it to man. Yes. Everything else He created then gave it to man, so He had to create the Sabbath, and then God gives the Sabbath to man. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are other reasons as well uh, why God uh, did not command Adam and Eve directly to keep the Sabbath. However, the fourth commandment uh, does go back to creation mm -hmm. Correct. because it says God works six, <laughs> Cease the seventh, and the fourth commandment says, Therefore, you are to work six, and you are to cease the seventh, because God did it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the fourth commandment sends you back to creation. It shows that the Sabbath existed at creation. And um, good point. And, and we would, if we were to use the same reasoning, then the other nine commandments wouldn't make any sense because there is no direct commandment also to keep the other nine. Yes. They're at creation. It mm -hmm. is implied, of course. If we, if we read carefully, we see that the other nine commandments are implied there, but there is no direct commandment, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, or any of those things. Yes. Uh, the only commandment was that they should not eat of the forbidden tree. That's the only direct commandment that we find there. You know, it's, it's very interesting that conservative Christians these days <laughs> will fight tooth and nail for marriage between a man and a woman. Yes. They'll say, we have to defend heterosexual marriage. And you ask them, why? Well, because God established heterosexual marriage at creation. And then I look at them and I said, what else did He establish at <laughs> creation? You can't pick and choose. You can't say right. marriage between a man and a woman because God made it that way. And then you say, but the Sabbath, no, that doesn't apply. Both of them are creation institutions. Yeah. Right. Yeah, my... my uh... My point it comes from the words of Jesus. He says, this, you know, the Sabbath was made for man, uh -huh. not man for the Sabbath. Right. That's he, the he did, for the Jew. Yeah, he didn't qualify what, what man. <laughs> <laughs> he just said, for mankind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that would imply from the beginning of mankind, you know, uh, from the beginning of the Sabbath, uh, it was given to man uh, as something that would be valuable to man. And that text proves that God had to make the Sabbath before He could give it to man. The <laughs> Sabbath was made yeah. mm -hmm. for, for man. Yeah. So God had to make the Sabbath and then He gives it to man. That's why yeah. there's no command to keep that first Sabbath because the first Sabbath is God's Sabbath. Yes. And then after that we follow His example. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's grab some text here and we're going to look at the idea uh, of what else makes the Sabbath uh, important here mm -hmm. uh, in this discussion. And so, uh, Pastor Bohr, 
If you can go to Exodus 20, uh, 8 through 11, Pastor Miranda, if you will look at Deuteronomy t uh, 5, 12 through 15. Uh, let's, let's see what we get. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Okay, this is the fourth commandment of mm -hmm. God's law. It reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, and then Pastor Miranda. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, the Bible says from the, reading from the King James Version, Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy man ser servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor thine cattle, nor thine stranger that is within thy gates, that m thy men servant and thy maid servant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Okay, so Deuteronomy is, is the second reading of the law, so yep. to speak. Uh, and uh, here we find two uh, implications mm -hmm. for Sabbath keeping. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how do they tie together in, 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 in your estimation, Pastor? Well, I have a simple answer. Redemption is recreation. Mm -hmm. And that is a relationship between the two. In, in Exodus 20, the emphasis on keeping the Sabbath is because God created. Mm -hmm. But in Deuteronomy 5, the, the reason for keeping the Sabbath is because God redeemed the people from Egypt. Uh, because we sin and we lost the image of God, Sabbath now adds an additional purpose, or Sabbath keeping has an additional purpose, and that is to recreate in us the image of God. That's why I like how the lesson put it, that Sabbath takes us back or calls us back to our roots. Mm. Not only the institutions, but also the moral roots that we have in Eden, the image of God. It's no coincidence that at the creation story, it says in verse 31 of Genesis 1, then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good, so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Mm -hmm. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Keyword. <laughs> then the very next verse, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And then it speaks about him ceasing or resting on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. In redemption, Jesus, who was the creator, yes. What is one of the last things he says on the cross? It is finished. Redemption is finished. Amen. Yes. yes. And then what does he do all Sabbath? Rest. He rests. He rests <laughs> from his work of redemption. And that's what Deuteronomy chapter 5 pointed to. Deuteronomy chapter 5 is talking about literal Israel being delivered from literal bondage and literal Egypt, but that pointed forward to Jesus delivering spiritual Israel from spiritual bondage to spiritual sin. Amen. And the Sabbath is the sign in both cases. Amen. Yeah, I find it interesting, you know, that uh, in, in, in many of the evangelical circles, you know, Adventists are seen as, as legalists because they keep the Sabbath. But Jesus is not seen as a legalist. 
<laughs> He's the, this loving God. But he was a Sabbatarian, <laughs> clearly in Scripture. Yeah, he kept the Sabbath. Amen. But yet he's, he, he, I, I've never heard him referred to as a legalist. Yeah, uh, right, right. What's the difference? <laughs> There's no difference. <laughs> you know, um, is it legalism to not, to not commit adultery? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> is it legalism not to steal? <laughs> no. <laughs> and I, I mean, it, and actually, it's, it will be good to define what legalism is, you know. Do that I, for I, us. I, I, I keep hearing not only about the Sabbath, but any other thing. Yes. Legalism is just the human effort to try to earn salvation without God's intervention. Mm -hmm. That's legalism. So I can have two attitudes towards Sabbath keeping. I can keep the Sabbath in a legalist way on my own thinking that I deserve or I will make it to heaven if I keep the Sabbath. That would be legalism. Or Sabbath as entering into God's rest. In other words, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I am forgiven of my sins. Actually, sin is what takes away rest. And because I'm forgiven of my sins now with Jesus, I can enter into His rest. And I can enter into his rest every day, but there is a specific day in time in the week when I can partake of that fellowship with him. So if I look at the Sabbath from that perspective, then it is redemptive. It is not legalistic. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go on to the next section. We're talking about an, a, a not so subtle deception. Uh, and uh, let's, let's, let's get a couple of uh, scriptures here to start our discussion. Pastor Boer, if you'll look at Psalms 33, 6 and 9. And Pastor Miranda, if you'll look at Hebrews 11, 3. Uh, let's see what we come up with here. Okay, Psalm 33, mm -hmm. verse 6 and verse 9. Yes. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. All right. Hebrews 11, 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Okay. Now, before I launch too deep in this discussion, I just want to add in a little something here in this not so subtle deception. And that is that uh, last week we studied the concept of the hour of judgment and we did the numeric calculations and, and we saw that this antitypical day of atonement, this, this, this judgment hour starts in 1844, mm -hmm. the pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment, 1844. And, and right about that same time, wouldn't you know it? Uh, the, uh, the beginnings mm. of the evolution theory uh, mm -hmm. come into the public domain. Yeah. Uh, you know, when Darwin, Darwin. publishes his, his first work, uh, later refined as uh, the origin. origin of the species. species. But uh, initially, uh, it's the, his initial publication began the ball rolling on, uh, on this uh, new idea of evolution. Uh, and so, uh, if there is this millennial uh, occurrence of, uh, of create, well, I don't want to call it creation, of being, if it takes this millennium to come into being, then there can't be a literal seventh day Sabbath because there Oops. aren't literal 24 hour days. Correct. Uh, and so that, that, that butts itself up uh, right up against the creation story. Yes. Um, now, your text says something that refutes the, the idea of this long periods of evolution. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, verse 33. Um, chapter 33. Chapter 33, yeah. yes, and verse 9. Yes. For he spoke... <laughs> And it took a million years to be done. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Yes. I mean, that speaks of rapidity. Yeah, it sounds like Quickness. instantaneous occurrences to <laughs> right. me. 
Yeah. And, and the amazing thing is he created something out of nothing. Yes. Ellen White says that he was not indebted to pre-existing matter. matter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, who can create something from nothing? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Only God. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you know, ex nihilo, huh? Ex nihilo, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, just something from from nothing. Nothing. Yes. Yeah. That that takes that takes a, a powerful person. That takes a mighty person to do that. Yeah. You know, even even those who believe in the evolutionary theory generally agree that the word day in Genesis chapter one is referring to a literal day. Yes. 24-hour day. Now, they might disagree with what Moses wrote, mm -hmm. right? Right. Or what God said. Yeah. But they agree that the word yom, the word day, is referring to a literal day of 24 hours because each time that the word yom appears with a numeral adjective, it's a literal day. Yes. All throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. And so they say, well, you know, uh, yeah, the writer that describes what happened in, in Genesis believed that, but you know now we know through scientific theory <laughs> that uh, evolution is more likely to explain the origins, <laughs> and and so y the decision is very simple: Do you have faith in God's word, or do you trust science, so-called? Yeah, mm -hmm. and that has to do largely with: Are 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 you willing to be accountable? <laughs> yeah, ultimately that's yes, the reason. Yes, yeah. yes. And you're a text pastor. So I read from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, where uh, we read that God again creates by His Word, but also out of nothing, ex mm -hmm. nihilo. And, and this, of course, brings to us the creationist position on, on the origin of things. Mm -hmm. God didn't need pre-existing matter. And I would like to go beyond what the lesson says, because believing that in the evolutionary theory will affect also my experience of salvation. God created by His Word, and God also saves, justifies, and sanctifies by His Word. Mm -hmm. Now, if I believe that God's Word takes millions and millions of years to have an effect on something, then I don't have any evidence to trust that that word will transform me and will give me victory today. Mm -hmm. I, won't, I wouldn't have any evidence and any basis to believe that when God says you're forgiven, that's going to take place today and now. Yes. God's word has immediate power. And we see, we don't have time to go there, but when we go to John 4, when, when Jesus heals the son of this nobleman, um, when he returns back home, <laughs> He asked the time. Yes. What time was he healed? Right. And then they tell him the time, and he realizes that that was the exact same hour when Jesus spoke the word. Yes. Yes. So the word of God has self-fulfilling power in the very exact time when he speaks the word. Speak the word only, says the centurion, and my servant shall be healed. Yes. So if, if, we, or if we don't believe that the word of God has that power, then... There is no basis to claim his promises. Yes. Yeah, ultimately, a denial of a literal creation destroys Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, because not only, uh, not only do you have uh, the destruction of accountability, but also, you know, why should we follow a diet based on plants? Mm. Why should marriage between a, be between a man and a woman? Why should you believe in two genders? Why should you keep a day of the week? It totally destroys the Christian economy mm -hmm. uh, and everything that God established in Genesis because if nothing, furthermore, if there was no Adam and Eve, there's no sin. Mm -hmm. And if there's no sin, there's no need of a Redeemer. Mm -hmm. And so not only does evolution destroy the concept of creation, it destroys the total Christian economy. Very good, very good. All right, uh, well... We need to move on or else we're going to get caught short here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next uh, topic is, is creation, the Sabbath, and the end time. So Sabbath has implications in the end time. It's interesting that in last week's lesson, when we studied about um, the 
uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary or the judgment, uh, this antitypical day of atonement, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, Daniel is given the word that this is for the end time. Uh, this is for the end time. Mm -hmm. It's for the future. Right. And so there, there are implications then that, that impinge on us about creation, the Sabbath, and end times. Uh, so in, uh, in Revelation 14, 7, it calls us to fear God and give glory to Him and worship Him mm -hmm. who created. Uh, and in Revelation 14, 9, uh, it says, uh, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, uh, of him shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Uh, and then in Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And some would say, well, you never mentioned the Sabbath. <laughs> Not even once in those, in, 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 in those verses. But how would you construct that so, so that someone could see it clearly, Pastor Boyer? Well, the bottom line is that the verbiage of Revelation 14, verse 7 is based on the fourth commandment. Yes. It comes from the fourth commandment. Now, why do we worship God? Uh, let's read Psalm 95, mm -hmm. which we always used to begin the worship Which's service at Fresno Central, Central yes. with. <laughs> it gives us a motivation for worship. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me just read that. What did I say? Psalm 95. 95. Yes. Uh, let's see. This is what it says. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth, the heights of the hills are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, yes. and His hands formed the dry land. So this refers to the Creator. Then verse 6 says, O come, let us worship mm -hmm. and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Mm -hmm. Why do we worship God? Because He is our Creator. Yes. And the language, once again, the verbiage there in Revelation 14, verse 7, comes from the fourth commandment. And the language of the fourth commandment comes from Genesis 2. Yes. Because it, in both you have the seventh day mentioned, and both you have God rested, God blessed, and God sanctified. Mm -hmm. It's the same Sabbath all yes. the way through. Yes. Now, we find something interesting in, in, in verse 9 here. It says, if anyone worships the beast in his image. So now there appears to be some competing right. entity here. Mm -hmm. Well, what we see here in the, in the three angels' messages is that worship would be the issue in conflict in the last days. Mm. Uh, everything will uh, revolve around worship. We're going, to, we're going to worship God, the Creator, or are we going to worship the beasts? Now, if we study the subject of worship even deeper, and we go back to creation, we see that before God created man and asked him to worship him, God, um, in, the, in the first six days, God provided everything that they needed to be happy everything they needed to survive, everything they needed to live. And now comes the seventh day. He tells them, I'm the creator. I did all this for you because I love you. And the response to that provider is worship. Mm -hmm. that, so in the last days, those who will worship the beast is because they never exercised faith to believe that it is only God the provider but they have depended more on the system to give them a false security mm -hmm. that be they believe is true security. Mm -hmm. And therefore, even knowing that the seventh day, some, that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God, even some of those knowingly, they will worship the beast and receive the mark of the beast because they never developed a faith in the true creator. Even though they believe that God creates, yet their faith was put on the systems of this world, on, the, on their paycheck, on their work, 
the finances, whatever, all the secular things that this world offers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and at the end, this external sign, both the Sabbath and, the, and uh, the seal of God and the mark of the beast, will reveal what kind of faith we, ha we had. Very well. It's interesting to me that, you know, uh, here we worship the Creator uh, on His day, um, and we believe that He will provide for us. Um, and then here in, the, in verse 9 of Revelation 14, there are those who worship the beast. And uh, the beast uh, has a mark, and we'll study this later, but only those who have his mark will be able to buy or sell. Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, he will provide. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, that's the point. For, for those who have his mark. May I read a text? Right. Yes. <laughs> Isaiah, real quick, Isaiah 44. You know why, why human beings started to worship a wooden idol? Isaiah 44 tells us. Why, why wood? Why would they worship the wood? Well, Isaiah 44 tells us here, uh, they started, you know, working with the wood, the carpenters, and this is what it says. The, comfort, the carpenter stretches, stretches out his rule. He maketh out a line. He fitted with plain. Well, he's describing here how He's building the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. Then verse 14, he says that he cuts down trees. Um, I want to jump to verse 15. It says, Then shall it be for a man to burn, for will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth and baketh bread. Now, notice that that piece of wood <laughs> is giving him some benefits. Mm -hmm. It's giving him warmth. He's able to cook with it. He's also able to build. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, what does he do? He maketh a god and worshipeth. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereon. And then it says at the end, and he says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. The, and then he prays to God, Deliver me, for you are my God. He prays to this wood, actually, the piece mm -hmm. of wood. So it's interesting that he starts working with the piece of wood and he, he sees, well, this piece of wood is pretty useful. Uh, I like it. I'm going to make a graven image out of this, and I'm going to worship it. Hmm. Instead of worshiping the one who made the wood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you know, there, there, there are those, in the end time, there is that, that competing factor here where either those who have placed their trust in God, uh, because it says in verse 12, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so going through the end times, which we will study as we go along, no doubt, uh, will require faith yeah. uh, as, as we go through tribulations and, 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 and trials and difficulties. Uh, but the saints will continue to keep the commandments of God, all 10 of them. <laughs> Amen. And they will have faith Amen. that God can do what he says, yeah. as Jesus did when he went to the tomb after he died, not being able to see past the portals of the tomb. He knew the Father was able to bring him back. Amen. And he did. And so we will have, we will need that same kind of faith. Yes. On the other hand, you know, there are those who will have their daily bread provided to them by the beast, which really doesn't require much faith, <laughs> if any at all. Yeah. Uh, but they, but they, they've aligned themselves so that they can have their daily needs met, but they are short-sighted because they don't see the eternal needs uh, and the eternal benefits of worshiping the Creator God. In the end time crisis, God's people are going to have to have the same faith that the three young men had in the Valley of Dura. Mm -hmm. Basically, they said, our allegiance to God is more important than life itself. Yes. And Daniel, when he was cast into the lion's den, Daniel said, my allegiance to God and my prayer life to Him are more important than my life. Ellen White states that only those who are willing to die rather than sin, hmm. will be the only ones that will go through the final crisis. Amen. Yes, Amen. yes. yes. Uh, 
I just wanted to uh, just touch really briefly on our last portion of our Sabbath school lesson, the Sabbath and the eternal rest. And I, of course, I wanted to refer to Isaiah 66 um, and, uh, and verse 22 here. And it says there, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And so in eternity future, we will still be worshiping the Lord every Sabbath. Amen. Each Sabbath. That doesn't end. You know what is interesting that the Sabbath both, both points back to creation, but points forward to the new heavens and the new earth. Mm -hmm. So it's like the bridge between Eden lost and Eden restored. And you know, in the beginning, God finished the sixth day. He says He finished. Mm. Rest of the seventh. In redemption, Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. Rest on the seventh. In Revelation chapter 21, uh, it says, um, let's see here, verse um, 6, verse 5, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Mm. And then the very next verse says, And he said to me, It is done. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and in each case, Isaiah tells us, that we will keep the Sabbath in commemoration of the new creation. Yeah, man. And of yeah. course, I believe that uh, God is going to take uh, the same amount of time to make a new heavens and a new earth as He did at the beginning. Yes. And there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, we are going to keep the seventh day to commemorate the new creation, yes. and you can't have a seventh without having the first six. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the interesting thing at um, the difference in the creation of Genesis and the creation of the new heavens and the earth, the new earth, uh, has to do with faith. You know, when Adam and Eve uh, were created, God showed them what He created for them, uh, but they didn't get to see Him created. It. Right. They had to uh, have faith that He was telling them the truth. Right. They had to have faith in His word. But as the, the song says, you know, in, in eternity future, our faith will be sight. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we will see Amen. God Amen. create Amen. Uh, this new heaven and new earth. And so our faith will be rewarded Amen. Uh, in sight. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, yeah. Amen. So now we walk by faith and not by, by sight. sight. Yeah. But in eternity future, we will see. Uh, what God has in store for us. And we will be even more thankful, not only for our redemption and our salvation, but for the beautiful creation that He has created for us. God bless you. We hope to see you next Sabbath. Shall we bow our heads and lift up our hearts in prayer. Gracious Father, how we praise you and thank you for the beauty of holiness for the loveliness of this Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen this time to tabernacle, as it were, with your children as we turn our hearts, our minds towards you, as we shut out the noise of the world and the workaday week and focus on the things of heaven. We ask, dear God, that you would accept our prayer and our praise and in exchange for these, we ask you to give us your presence and your power. Bless us not only during this time that we share together here at Secrets Unsealed in Some TV, but bless us throughout the sacred hours of the Sabbath. And not just this Sabbath, but each and every Sabbath as we draw closer to you, seeking a word from the Lord, seeking your power in our lives, seeking salvation, seeking the best for us, our children, our neighbors, our friends, our family, and all of those who call upon the mighty and holy name of Jesus. 
We know that there are sick among us. Some are home watching because they are ill. Some are home watching because they want to be part of the Secrets Unsealed worship experience. So Father, for whatever reason, there are those who are watching and consuming what we have to offer. May I plead in the name of Jesus that you would speak through us all, the Sabbath school people and the song service people and the special music people and the children's story people and the worship service and preached word. May each element move together to draw our hearts, our minds closer to you. For we want this Sabbath to bring us one Sabbath closer to the coming of the Lord as each 24 hour period brings us one day closer to the time when we shall see you face to face. So bless us, Lord, as we study together, as we give you our offering of praise. We praise you and thank you for your promise not only to be with us during this time, but to hear and to answer the prayer of faith in Jesus' name, amen. Today's Bible story is found in Luke 7, 1, named the faith of the centurion. Once there was an army captain who had 100 soldiers. Now, a Roman centurion is a commander of 100 soldiers. So this man had, was taken charge of all these men. He was a very important man and his soldiers always obeyed when he told them to do something. The captain had many servants also. They obeyed the captain too and the captain was very kind to his soldiers and his servants. Typically, the centurions were very ruthless men and mean and hostile, but not this centurion. One day, a servant, one of his servants became very sick. The captain wanted to help him. The captain knew Jesus helped people, and he knew Jesus could make his sick servant well again. The captain sent some of the Jewish leaders to find Jesus. He said, go look for him so he can make my servant well. And they told Jesus, this man needs your help. He's done a lot for our people. He had a synagogue built for us. Please help him, Jesus. Please help him. So Jesus went with the leaders. Some of the captain's friends met them before they reached the captain's home. They had a message for Jesus from the captain. He said, this is what he said. I am not good enough to have you come to my house. That's why I did not come to you myself. All you have to do is say that my servant will get well and it would happen. That's all you have to do is say it and it'll happen. I know what it's like to be in charge of people. I tell my soldiers go and they go. I tell them do this and they do it. That's how I know you can help my servant. Now, the centurion must have known of Jesus previously to believe that he could heal people with a single command. He seemed to understand that Jesus had a divine power. Jesus rewarded the centurion's faith by healing his servant. Now, Jesus was happy about the captain and said to him, he said to the people there, I have never, ever met anyone with so much faith in me. Jesus made the servant well because of the captain's faith in him. When the captain's friends returned to the house, the servant was well. Oh, what joy and what happiness he brought them. You know, God is happy when we have faith like the centurion. He wants you to have faith like this. He wants me to have this strong faith. And our faith pleases God, just like the centurion, centurion pleased God with his faith. So let's please the Lord and let's ask for more faith so we can have this strong faith and we believe. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. There were present at that season 
some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Psalm TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for helpful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Sum TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. As always, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this part of the worship experience here at Sum TV. 
Each Sabbath, we try to bring you messages that are current, that have something to say to the end time generation. And we pray that this message will be no accepted exception to that established pattern. The title of our message is The Day the Tower Fell. The Day the Tower Fell. Turn with me, if you will, to the gospel as written by Luke. We want to consider Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, and I will read in your hearing verses 1 through 5. Luke 13, 1 through 5, I will be reading from the New King James Version. The day the tower fell. Shall we pray, Father God, we beg you, Lord, for your presence and power. We want you to speak now. We want you to be the author and finisher of our faith, but we also want you to give us the presence of your Holy Spirit so that we can put into practice those things that we learn and be better prepared for the day when Christ returns. So please, dear Father, speak to us, speak through the deficient human instrument, Give me divine grace so that your people will be filled with your spirit as they understand the power of your word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 13, beginning at 1 and continuing to verse 5 in the New King James. The Bible says, There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such Things. A very important rhetorical question that Christ is asking. Because they suffered such things, I tell you, no. So he answers his own question. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? This is a very interesting conundrum that Christ is, is, is putting forth here. I tell you, again, he answers his own question, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Now, we could spend an awful lot of time just looking at the syntax and looking at the, the uh, history of the words that Christ used here um, because he chose his words very, very carefully, and we will parse some of this before we are done. This is not a sermon that I have, that I can remember hearing preached. Um, I don't recall ever hearing a sermon on this particular passage. Um, thinking back, I just, I just don't remember anybody tackling this particular passage. And I don't claim to be able to give a full theological uh, scholarly treatment of it, simply to give a pastoral overview of some of the things that I think Christ put in here and that he put in for a particular pur purpose because he wanted God's people to have their eyes open and their heads up and not be so judgmental in looking at other individuals that they would lose sight of their own insufficiencies and their own need to serve the Savior. So I suspect that uh, it's important because Jesus chose to make it so. Greek, Jew, uh, Luke as, as a, 
a writer of the gospel. Some say he was a Greek. Some say he was a non-Jew. Um, some say simply a diaspora Jew. But Luke recorded it. Christ preached on it. So it must have something to say to us, particularly when Luke puts something in his gospel. As you well know, Luke, I, I often call the sort of ACLU of the New Testament. Luke put things down that were very, very important to him. He was very, very cognizant of and aware of the plight of women in the Bible. Um, and so when women did something that was noteworthy, Luke recorded it. Uh, sometimes he was the only one to record it. Certainly if it was of note, Luke would put it down. When non-Jews did something that was noteworthy, Luke was one of the ones who would put it down. That's why we have the story of the Good Samaritan uh, in, in, in Luke, uh, because the person was a Samaritan. Um, other Bible writers may overlook that, being part of the popular culture that didn't really value Samaritan contributions to the gospel story too much. Luke, on the other hand, did, and we find that in Luke. You, you will find some things in Luke that are only in Luke because of the kind of person Luke was and his concern for those who are outside the norm of Jewish society, but who also loved the Lord and had contributions to make to the gospel message. So Luke was always careful to put those kind of things down. So we see this particular story. Before we go into it, let me ask you uh, some questions, some thought questions. These are um, thinking kind of questions. They, they may sound a bit rhetorical, they may not, but they're, they're questions designed to evoke thought more than elicit an answer. One, and I want you to answer these out loud. Do that favor for me. Even though I will not hear you, answer them out loud wherever you are in your room or in your living room or wherever you're uh, watching this broadcast in front of your computer screen or on your television set. Answer the questions out loud. Uh, maybe your husband's with you. Maybe your wife is with you. So talk to them in your answering of the questions. But don't just answer them in your head. Audibilize your answer. All right, here we go. Do you think that only good things happen to good people? Now, before you answer, you're probably saying, are you kidding? The only good things happen to good people? Sometimes bad things happen to good people. So that's the second question. Do bad things happen to good people? So your first two questions. Do only good things happen to good people? Do bad things happen to good people? And as you're answering these questions, maybe visualize in your brain, in your mind, someone who fits that category that something has happened to either good or bad. A, a good person has had good things happen to them. Uh, a good thing, a good person who has had bad things happen to them. And if you can think of individuals that way, it, that really answers your question for you. Next question. Do good things happen to bad people? Do good things happen to bad people? Do bad people inherit money? Do, do good things, things that we would call as, as good things, do they happen to bad people? All right. Next question. Remember, you're, you're, you're talking back to me. I can't hear you, but you are. You're talking back to me, and you're talking out loud. When bad things happen to good people, all right, when bad things happen to good people, what is God trying to say? What is God saying? When he allows bad things to happen to good people, what's he trying to say? Maybe you don't believe bad things ever happen to good people, but think your way through the answer. When bad things happen to good people, what is he trying to say? He, that is God, trying to say. When good things happen to bad people, is God speaking out of the other side of his mouth? In other words, you got a person who is considered a bad person and good things happen to them. Well, is God speaking double-tongued or fork-tongued or is he speaking out of the other side 
of his mouth. Think about that and then answer out loud. Right? Next question. When God speaks, how many points of life is he trying to make? I'll ask it again. When, when God speaks, when God makes his will known, that's how we say he speaks. It's not always audible. In fact, most times it's not. But when God speaks through circumstances, through uh, the occasional audible voice, when God speaks, what points or how many points is he trying to make when he speaks? All right, we're moving on. Does God say a bunch of different things or one thing many different ways? So when God speaks to the human family, and that's, that's the object, that's the, the, the un, unspoken statement here. We're talking about God's interplay, God's social and spiritual intercourse with us. When God speaks to the human family, how many points is he trying to make? Does he say a bunch of different things? Or does God say one thing many different ways? Speak it out. Audibilize your answer. Moving on. How many messages does God have? We, we talk about the three angels' messages, and, and I maintain it's one message out of the mouths of three different angels. The three angels' message is, is sort of a compound, complex message. It's got facets, but it's really one message. Three parts, but one message. So how many messages does God have? For me... The truth be told, God only has one message, only one, just like the three angels' messages are really one message in the mouth of three angels, God only has one message. And the truest, the clearest, the cleanest articulation of that message is Jesus Christ. We know that from so many different things. One of the, one of the ways we know it is because one of the disciples asked God, uh, show us the, ask Christ rather, show us the Father. And of course we know Christ's answer, but if you, if you boil down that answer, basically Christ was saying, watch me. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the clearest articulation of what God is and who God is and uh, uh, what God is all about came out of the mouth of Christ when he was asked, show us the Father, he said, basically, you're looking at him. So the clearest message, you want to know what God is about? You want to know what salvation is about? You want to know what Christ-like living is about? You want to know what Christian living is about? You want to know how to address and redress the world that you live in and that you find yourself in? Look at Jesus. He is the answer to all of your questions. So let's look again at what he, that is Jesus, had to say about good and bad people. Let's reread the text in light of what I just spoke to you about. We return now to Luke chapter 13, and we begin reading at verse 1. I'll read it a little faster now, since this is the second time we're going through this. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So there were individuals. This is not a, a story that Christ was there for. He was told about this. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose, this is the people that carry the story to Jesus, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered 
such things. Now, Christ is addressing a specific idea that we're going to go into in just a moment about how Jews thought about non-Jews and about uh, non-Orthodox Jews. So Christ is saying, you know, they tell him this bad uh, incident. Christ doesn't say, oh, that's too bad. Wow, that's really bad stuff. That's not good at all. Uh, Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Okay, now we go to verse three. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He's using his words very carefully. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem. He's, he's, he's begging a point here. I tell you again, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is very, very important stuff because Christ is given a report here about some tragic things that happened, and he doesn't talk about the event. He doesn't talk about the tragedy itself. He doesn't talk about the, the, the terrible, the terrible nest, can I co coin that term? Of, of the events, he turns it right around and talks to those who carry the story to him. Do you think that those people who suffered these tragedies were deserving of the tragedies, were the worst people in the world that you're bringing me this story? What do you think happened to them and why did it happen to them? Look at yourself before you look at them, or look at yourself while you are looking at them, while you are judging them in your minds. You better use this opportunity to look at your own life. And that's what Christ is saying to them. You brought me this story. You're wringing your hands over them. You need to ask uh, yourself the question, what about me? In other words, ask not for whom the bell tolls, maybe tolling for you. The, scripture, the scriptures here were current events, not history. So when these things happened, they were current events. They weren't history. They weren't old stories. They were things that are happening right then. And Christ was telling them, take this current event and use it as a launching point for a self-examination to make sure that you are where God would have you to be. So these are events that are happening at that very time. Everybody knew about it. These were events that happened. The information spread across Jerusalem, spread across Judea, spread across Galilee. Everybody knew about these events. So it wasn't something that was done in secret. These events were very public. Everybody knew about them. Everybody was talking about them. Everybody had an opinion on them. And now it's being drawn, brought to Jesus. And they're really, the subtext is, they're really trying to get Christ to offer some sort of counsel, some sort of opinion, some sort of commentary on these things. And Christ was not drawn into that commentary. He, in effect, turned the commentary around and put it on the heads and in the hearts of those who were bringing him the information. These were two tragic incidents, and Jesus used them to teach a lesson. It was important to the Jews, and it is important to us today in these last days. That's the lesson for us today. If it was important to them, it's important to us. Luke thought it so, as did Jesus. So let's examine the social and psychological ramifications of what Christ is pushing here and what he is pushing back on. The Jesus, I'm sorry, the Jews rather in general, Sadducees in particular, didn't believe in divine inter intervention. We, we see that from Paul's dealing with the Sadducees in the book of Acts. They didn't believe that God would put his hand in and change and rearrange stuff. They didn't believe in divine intervention. So if something bad happened to you, you were either a bad person or a good person who was doing bad at the time the bad thing happened. Now, this is very, very important. I want you to get this. We want to slow down just a little bit. They didn't believe 
the Sadducees, and the Sadducees had much sway in Jerusalem and in Judea and in the land of the Jews because the Sadducees were the priestly aristocracy. They were the hoity-toity, the, these are the guys with the money and the influence. The Pharisees were lay leaders in the temple, a little more pragmatic. The Sadducees had the real money, had the real clout, had the real power. The high priests, the Caiaphases and people like that came from the sect of the Sadducees, not the Pharisees. So the, 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 the creme de la creme, the upper crust of Jerusalem society, as far as spiritual society was concerned, were Sadducees. They didn't believe in divine intervention. So given that mindset, the default setting on that mindset is bad things didn't happen to truly good people because there was no divine intervention. Life flowed on as it's supposed to. Um, yeah, pretty much. Life flowed on as, as it was supposed to. You, you, you lived a certain way, and the way you lived resulted in certain outcomes, and there was no God to step in and change that. Now, let me stop and ask you a question. I want you again to answer out loud. And I wish I had a, 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 a big, big audience here, and I would, I would make them answer out loud. How many are willing to stand and say, uh, as is said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, and Mark chapter 10, verse 18, uh, which tells us no one is good, how many would say, I am a good person? You know, I, I, I preached this sermon once before. Fairly decent-sized group of people. And I asked, how many would stand and say, I'm a good person? And you know, in that church, no one stood. Found it rather interesting. Nobody is willing to stand before his brothers and sisters, husband or wife, and say, I am a good person. Now, it is true. Matthew 19 and Mark 10 say that no one is good, but no one is willing to stand and say, I am good. Yet, truth be told, most people think that. They may not say, I am good, but they're thinking, no, I'm not so bad. You may not audibleize it because it seems rather crude, lewd, abusive to say I'm a good person. It seems rather stuck on yourself. But most people think, I'm not so bad. Now, there are some people who are, who are evil and rotten and know they are. But most people pretty much look at their lives and say, you know what, I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm not the, I may not be the best person in the world, but I'm not, I'm not so bad. Somewhere in the middle, I'm not really a bad person. So some Jews thought, and taught that if something spectacularly bad happened to you, I want you to get this, because this is, this is taught in the rabbinic writings. If something really bad happened to you, something spectacularly bad happened to you, it was because you were a spectacularly bad person. So then, if something really bad happened, given that belief system that bad always follows bad, bad deeds are always followed by bad consequences, light, like light follows day, um, you give bad, you get bad, and rabbinic writings taught this. If you read the Gemaras and uh, some of the... Uh, rabbinic commentary. So if something bad happens to you, my brother, my sister, why are you whimpering about it? You are a de facto bad person. I want you to get this understanding. Rabbinic thought was, 
if something bad happened to you, it is because or a consequence of you being a bad individual. Now, the tentacles of that kind of thinking are very, very long. So if you are a bad person and something bad happened to you, you simply got what you deserved. Now, that's, that's, that's almost cancerous carcinogenic thinking, but that was prevalent in the times of Christ. That explains why the Jews felt no real compunction to help fellow Jews who were down on their luck. In other words, if bad is happening in your life, it's because you're a bad person. And if you're a bad person, then there's no reason for me to help you out of your bad situation because you're simply getting what you deserve. So this is the kind of mindset that Christ is pushing back against. I want you to understand this. When you've got a, a whole race of people, particularly temple leadership, that says bad things happen to bad people, God does not intervene. So when a bad person gets bad stuff, you're simply getting the results of your life. Or when a seemingly good person has something bad happen to them, then they are being repaid for being bad or evil. That explains why um, the Jews, again, felt no, comp no compunction to help those who were down on their luck. That's fellow Jews, let alone Gentiles and Samaritans. Which explains, brothers and sisters, the background, the subtext of the Good Samaritan story. When the rabbis and the Sadducees and the leaders came by and passed on the other side, they didn't have any compunction, any feeling to help that poor Samaritan. One, he was a Samaritan. Two, if something bad happened to him, must be because they're a bad person. Now, you see where that, the logical extent of that kind of thinking goes. Nobody helps anybody. If something bad happened to you, well, too bad. You're a bad person. Why should I help you? If life has, has given you lemons, it must be because you are a lemon or your life is lemon-like. Which explains why the Jews felt justified. See, this is how one thing dovetails upon another. One thing follows another. One thing goes after another. Which explains why the Jews felt justified in treating the Samaritans like dirt. Which explains why the high priest John Hyrcanus, during the intertestamental, intertestamental period, took an army north and burnt down the Samaritan temple on Mount Garrison. They felt justified in burning down the temple on Mount Garrison because it was a rival temple to the temple in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans worshiped there. So John Hyrcanus, who was a high priest, by the way, the high priest, lord of the temple, took an army north and burned to the ground the temple on Mount Garrison as uh, erected by the Samaritans. He lost no sleep over that act. When Christ went to Samaria, that temple was still in ruins, was not even rebuilt so thoroughly, so thorough, rather, was the destruction of the temple on Mount Garrison. So when that woman at the well spoke to Jesus, and she said the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, she was only half right. She was half right, not all right. They did have some dealings with the Samaritans, uh, the kind of dealings that, I've got to say this gently so I don't sound too crass, but the same kind of dealings that a human has with a, a cockroach. You see it, you step on it. Thus the saying, 
that was very popular in Christ's day, before and after, better to die of thirst than accept a drink of water from a Samaritan. That's the mindset. And it's justified by the societal influences that say if bad things are happen to you, happening to you, it is because you are a bad person. That is the mindset, the self-righteous, self-satisfied minds that Christ was fighting against. So Christ is fighting against this mindset. So when this story is brought to them, Christ doesn't waste time in ersatz sympathy. He simply says, you better look at yourself. because he was tired of Jewish self-righteousness, which was con constantly flaunting itself in the face of his ministry. Here then, brothers and sisters, is the rub. We do it today. When certain evil befalls certain people, we tend to say, I wonder what he or she was doing to deserve that. Notice the language, to deserve that. In other words, if something really bad happens, we must have been doing something to get that kind of outcome. What good does anybody deserve? So Christ is, is laying down a pattern for our thought and our judgment in these last days. Let's go back um, to this message. You are lost in sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died to save you. Come to Jesus. That is, in, in short, the whole, the only message that God gives. One message. Only one. Heaven has only one message. I say it again because it comes in parts, but it's one message. You are lost in sin, A. B, the wages of sin is death, B. C, Jesus died to save you from sin, C. D, come to Jesus. The whole Bible can be summed up in that short message. Lost in sin, sin is death, Christ saves you from sin, come to Jesus. That's why I, I tend to end, end all my emails. Anyone gets an email from me or a letter, I end it with grace and peace. Grace and peace is the gospel message in, in three words. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. And I, if I'm feeling a bit more loquacious, I say grace and peace, wisdom and strength. Ellen White says we ought to have the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to do it. And then I always end it if I, if I have time with blessing and honor. So you'll see from... From me, grace and peace, which is the gospel. Grace of God brings peace, and that means eternal peace, not just temporary peace. Wisdom and strength, wisdom to know what is right, strength to do it, from the spirit of prophecy, and then blessing and honor uh, from the book of Revelation. Uh, grace and peace, wisdom and strength, blessing and honor. Come to Jesus. So let's look at these incidents and put them under a microscope for just a moment and uh, hope my time will last. All right. Let's go back to verse 4. We're in Luke chapter four, four, uh, 13, rather. Verse 4. Or those 18 upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? All right. Christ is saying they lost their lives. They lost their lives. You who are bringing me this story may lose your soul. That's why he used the word, he used the word perish. The Greek word apolomai doesn't mean sleep or death. It means utter destruction or second death. So Christ is contrasting the death of those upon whom the tower fell with the lives of those who are bringing the story because they died unless the storyteller's heart is right 
they may perish. Perish is a word that Christ uses, which is much stronger than death. When Christ uses perish, he's talking about ultimate destruction. So you are wringing your hands about the death of those 18 people, and you may be in danger not only of dying, but perishing. Do you think their death was because they were the worst people in all of Jerusalem? Now, he doesn't answer that question. Well, he, he actually he does. Uh, he says, I tell you, no. So he's asking the question. He's answering the question in order to teach a lesson. Do you think there were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Did that tower fell on them because they were the worst people in town? No. And then Christ ends the discussion there. He doesn't deal with them anymore, but he turns it around to the people who are bringing the story. This is a very, a very interesting, a very intricate piece of Bible uh, uh, instruction here. It's only five verses, but there's a lot that's going on here. So Christ says, I'm telling you, no, they weren't the worst. Cuts it off there. We're not going to talk about them anymore, them anymore, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He doesn't say you're all going to die. You're, he doesn't say a tower is going to fall on you. He says, basically, unless you repent, you will lose your soul. You will lose eternity. So Christ is saying, don't spend so much time wringing your hands over this story. Use it as a jumpstart for looking at and examining your own life because unless you repent, the tower falling is not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is that you will not die, but perish. Apollomai, utter destruction. So basically Christ is telling us, among other things, this. When you read the newspaper, when you look at the television set, when you listen to the radio, when you consume popular culture and popular media, don't get so caught up in what's happening to the world around you that you forget to use these things as red flags in your own life. Because whether they die in the Lord or outside of the Lord is not under your control. What is left to you is to work out your salvation with fear and trembling and make sure your life is so conducted that you don't perish. Now let's run to Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. I'm going to turn to it and also we're going to go to Luke 12, but I want to know, do Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And we're just about there, Matthew 12, 11, 10, 28. All right, Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him. And if you've got uh, a King James Bible like I do, the him is capitalized, so we know what it's talking about, who's able to, to destroy both soul and body in hell. All right, that's Matthew 10, 28. We're going to flip over quickly to Luke, and I'm looking for Luke 12, 5, and 6. Luke 12, 5, and 6. I like the way Luke puts things. So when I read it in Matthew, which tends to be the abridged version, I try to go to, to, to Luke if it's in both places because Luke always adds a word or two. So a word or two. So we're in Luke 5, Luke 12, 5, and 6. But I will show you whom you shall fear. See, Luke takes a little more time. I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him, again, him is capitalized, who after he has killed, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Fear him. So Luke is, is, um, is saying the same thing, but he uses a little more word. His, his language is a little more flowery than Matthew, who is very sort of draconian and, and kind of gives you in nuts and bolts terms. Luke is a little more flowery. I say to you, my friends, Fear that individual. So 
Christ is saying, don't, don't fear the circumstances that will kill your body. Have fear, have deference for, have respect for him, capital H, that's God, him who has power of the here and now and all eternity. That's who you need to fear. So when you read the story of the tower falling on those 18 people, be sad for them, sure, but also use it as testimony, as commentary on your own life and make sure that you are right with God. Let every time you hear of a tragedy, rather than ruminating on the tragedy, ask yourself the self-important question, what about me? What about me? How shall it be with me? If this day were my last day, what would be God's judgment on me? The tower fell. Some may say, act of God. We, we tend to blame God for everything that we don't understand, particularly acts of nature. Some may say sloppy construction. Some may say poor workmanship. Some may even say substandard materials. And we have heard of tragedies in our modern days that have been attributed to all of these. Sloppy construction, poor workmanship, substandard materials. Um, you know, we, we've heard that some may even say fate. But being in Jesus supersedes all that. Let me say this, because I've thought about this in my life for a long time. Uh, and I've said this before. When I was at the Ephesus Church, my membership was 2,142 members. During the seven years that I pastored that church, I preached 117 funerals. That's a lot of funerals. And I have many, many stories uh, about funerals at the Ephesus Church. At all of those funerals, particularly when I knew the life of the person, and the person lived, as far as I could determine, a good life, I would say the following. Death in Christ is not such a bad thing. Better to live in Jesus than to die without him. You understand. Death in Christ is not, is not the worst thing that can happen to you. It is better to live in Jesus than to die without Jesus because it has been predestined that those who live in Jesus and die in Jesus will live forever. So whenever you die, if you, if you get cut short, if you get your three score and ten, or if like my, my beloved mother-in-law who lived 101 and died just two months short of her 102nd birthday and was lucid and uh, in good shape and in good health for 101 of her almost 102 years. The last several months were not so good. But at her 101st birthday, uh, she was doing good. At, at her 100th birthday, she had five different birthday parties. She had joined and been part of five different churches, and the, the grandkids gave her a party, and the kids gave her a party, and three of the churches gave her a party. So she had five different birthday parties. And, and, and one of them, she even uh, at her 100th birthday, she even danced with the president of the country. Uh, that's how good a shape she was at 100 years old. But... My point is, whenever you die, if you die in Jesus, you won because the promise is that those who die in Christ will live forever. So the question really is, does it matter if they were the worst in, in Jerusalem or if they were not? Well, Christ said, no, they were not the worst. But bad things happen sometimes to good people. The thing that we have to live for is to live for Christ so that whatever happens to us, we are in Jesus and the promises of Christ to those who live in Jesus are preset, are preordained, they are sure. So whenever you die, if you die in Christ, brothers and sisters, you have won. So then you must live every day in Jesus so that if your 
dare I say, number is called, you are ready because those who die in Jesus will live forever. And I said that 117 times at the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in Manhattan, New York. Those who die in Jesus live forever. So death in Christ is not such a bad thing. Better to die in Jesus than to live without him. And I dare say you can say amen. Amen. So Christ's statement is true. Do you think they were the worst people? No. Of course they weren't. Because God doesn't play petty like that. But the thing is true that sometimes bad things happen to good people. But if you really are good and you really are in Jesus, then even when a bad, things hap a bad thing happens to you, you are prepared for that. And more importantly, God is prepared for that because he has promised that those who live in Jesus and who die in Jesus will, glory to God, live forever. So what then is your task? Your task, my task, is to live each day in Jesus. So if perchance that day is your last day, you die in Jesus, and you will live forever. So it's not so much about how you die, whether the tower falls on you or something happens. It's how you live that's important. It's living for Jesus that's important. Not necessarily dying for him. You die in him as you live, so shall you die. You know, let me say this in closing. I am so glad in looking at this sermon because I've, I didn't have a chance even to get to the part about Pilate uh, mingling the blood of the saints. That's a, another whole message that I guess we'll have to take a look at because it, it goes with this. Um, we took the second part first and the first part second. If you're reading uh, Luke, you realize that it starts with Pilate, ends with Salome. I started with Salome and uh, we didn't get time to end with Pilate. I'm thankful for this. I'm, in, I'm in a television guy. I'm in television in ministry. There are two ways to take a record of somebody visually. You can do a snapshot and you can do a video. A snapshot is your life at a point in time. A video extends out throughout the length of your life. Aren't you glad, as am I, that God judges us on the video, not the snapshot? Now think about that. What you are today, you may not be tomorrow. You may not be next week. But the video will capture that. The snapshot freezes you at that point in time. God won't judge you on the snapshot. He will judge you on the video. God bless you. See you.
Pray now with me, if you will. Shall we pray? Father God, we praise you and thank you for your word and for the power of that word. We are thankful, Lord, for the reminder, the caution that Christ gives us not to be so concerned about the things of this world, nor to judge others harshly, but to look to our own souls to make sure that we are surrendered to you, to make sure that we are walking with you, to make sure that our souls are in line with your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, as we look at the newspaper, uh, watch television, consume radio broadcasts and podcasts and other streams of information to look at these things as harbingers of the last days, to understand that the tumult and the terrible things that we see happening in our world are but signs to let us know that Christ is coming soon. Help us, Lord, to read the signs and understand their import for our lives, for our present and for our future. Help us, dear Lord, to take note of the time, as the Bible says, to be aware of the times in which we live, to know that it is high time for God's people to awake out of sleep and to walk in the light as light shall remain. Bless us, dear Father, to be aware of the times and to respond appropriately to the lateness of the hour so that we know and understand that Christ is coming soon so that we will not be unprepared, so that we will work while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work, so that we will be ready, waiting for you when you come to take your children home. Thank you, dear Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.